Finding a Memory, written by Shatona Havig, narrated by Krista Del Sorbo. Chapter 4 Put that bicycle away, Patricia Ann Mercer. You weren't raised in a barn. Still hearing her mama's voice in her head at 64 wasn't fair. Some days, Patty didn't know if she'd ever feel like the adult in Skimmer Cottage, despite having lived alone in it for nearly 20 years. In a rare act of memorial defiance, Patty left the bicycle propped against the fence anyway and pulled her tote bag from the basket. A couple of stray leaves had blown their way onto her porch. Those Patty picked up before entering the cottage and beginning the never-ending debate— to leave it open for fresh air, or close it and not need a sweater. The decision to get back to her late fall, almost winter, house cleaning left her in the front room with the door open. That kind of work would warm her up. She'd start right there with the shelf in the corner. She rearranged a clock and the stack of three poetry books she'd decided to keep. Half a minute later, she removed one of the books. There. Perfect. Two minutes after that, Patty replaced the book, liking an odd number stacked there, and shuffled the books and clock back into their previous positions. Why mess with perfection? The shelf under the coffee table, the old telephone table, even the coat closet. There wasn't anything left to do in the front room, and no amount of trying to change things up would improve it. The kitchen? Out of the question. She had no intention of even considering it. Not her room, not the attic, but maybe. Patty strolled down the hall to the downstairs guest room. A double bed with her grandmother's quilt on it, a bureau, a dressing table, and boxes. Tons of boxes in the closet, along the walls, a lifetime of accumulation all stuffed into a 12 by 14 space. It was time to deal with this room. After pacing the small area not covered by stuff, Patty reached for the top right drawer of the dressing table. Inside, she found a pink acrylic shell complete with powder puff and powder that probably had been in that drawer for 50 years. Or 40, probably 40. Of course, she hadn't brought in trash bags or empty boxes, but in no time flat, she'd retrieved a few and dumped the powder into a plastic garbage bag. A cloud of powder enveloped her. Patty coughed. Why did people think pouncing this stuff on them was a good idea? It's death to the... <coughs> she coughed again. Lungs. Most of that drawer went straight into the garbage. Old catalogs, a plastic rain bonnet with roses printed on it. When was the last time anyone wore one of those tacky things? If Lisa were here, I'd hear about it. The next drawer held about 50 balled-up stockings. Just by the size of each one, she could tell if they were knee-high, thigh-high, sheer waist, or control top. Patty tossed them all in the bag, and yet another cloud of powder rose up. This time, she twisted that bag and settled it inside another one. Wasteful or not, she'd be coughing for a week if she didn't. The top left drawer held a few pieces of costume jewelry. Granny's ear bobs a brooch, and a couple of necklace boxes with pendants on fine chains. Nothing worth much, but they might fetch a few dollars from a scrap dealer. Surely the youth group could do that to raise funds for whatever they needed at the moment. As she pulled open the bottom left drawer, memories flooded her. Trembling hands fingered the miniature cedar box she'd gotten with her graduation hope chest. Every bit of her demanded she slam that drawer shut and leave the room, well, every bit but one. Memory whispered, It's time. She pulled out the chest and set it on the dressing table. Memory kept whispering encouragement, prodding her to lift the lid and face a past she fled. And one she wouldn't change either, mostly. In an attempt to distract herself, Patty stared at the box as her hands stroked the top. Wrinkled fingers she almost didn't recognize filled her vision. When did I get to be so old? When did I leave my teens and enter my sixties? At the bottom of the little box lay six rings, the thick, wide band that had been her father's, plain and sturdy just like him. 
the fine, thin gold band that had been Mama's, the tiny diamond engagement ring she'd never worn after Patty had been born. It never fit after you came along. Patty pulled out her own, even tinier diamond chip sitting atop a sliver of gold and the matching sliver of a band. Jonathan's class ring tried to overshadow them and succeeded. Her hands shook again as she pulled that thick ring from the chest, the blue stone dull after years of neglect. Those rings she slid to one side. Wedged into the bottom of the little chest was a folded paper, one she didn't want to pull out. A tear slid down her cheek, followed by a twin on the other side. Paper in hand, she unfolded it. Marriage certificate. Patty's heart squeezed until she almost couldn't breathe and she ran her thumb over the signatures on it. We were so young, so in love, so naive. Her chest closed in on her until Patty's lungs screamed for one last gulp of air. I was naive anyway. A lock of baby hair and the keepsake certificate from the hospital with Lisa Janelle Weston neatly typed and her doctor's signature at the bottom corner. When had she put that in the box? Patty would have pulled them out but changed her mind. That's where they belonged. When she came across Lewis's, she'd put them in too, and their baby spoons her mama had bought. She'd find a nice place to put the little chest with those mementos. The rings, however... Emotions rolled and built, crashing over her and leaving her wrung out in their wake. Patty went in search of her phone. Not in her purse. Not on the charger. Where? Oh, the tote bag, of course. She dug through it and pulled out the electronic choke chain. That wasn't fair. Patty usually liked having a way to get a hold of her children or a way to get help if something happened. But in contrary moments, she resisted. Not this time. Patty tapped the screen. She'd offer the rings to Lisa first, then Lewis. Lisa's honeyed tones belied the irritation Patty knew her daughter felt at being interrupted. Saturday mornings were for calls, not Thursdays. Mama, are you all right? Translation, you'd better be dying if you're bothering me on a Thursday. I'm all right, still going through the house. There's a word for what you're doing, Mama. Durstadning. It's Swedish for death cleaning. Is there something you're not telling me? I'm just getting rid of all this junk. I don't want another storm to blow through and make me do it on its terms is all. Most of what's in this old place is stuff I don't even care about. The clicking of a pen cap told her what was next, but Patty tried to head it off. Look... I don't want to bother you, but I ran across a few things I wanted to offer you first before I call Lewis. If appealing to the firstborn competitiveness in Lisa was a sin, then Patty was in serious trouble. A woman should not be so nervous about annoying her own daughter. What is it? Caught your interest now, didn't I? Patty snapped a few pictures and sent them. Grandma and Grandpa Mercer's wedding bands and her engagement ring my rings and your daddy. I don't want anything associated with that man and you know it. Grammy's rings are sweet, but I have no use for them, and I doubt either of the kids will want something so old-fashioned and almost impossible to see. Uh, take it that's a no, then. And don't call Lewis, Mama. He'll feel like he has to take them to make you happy when he doesn't want anything from the man any more than I do. Mail them to some Weston somewhere if you must. Frankly, I'd just give them to a pawn shop. I have to go. She had to say it. Patty avoided confrontation whenever possible, but this time it needed to be said. Lisa. I, Lisa, listen to me. You need to know this. Your daddy loved you more than anyone in his life. After a few seconds, Lisa snapped back. Well, he had a funny way of showing it. Patty swirled the rings around on the dressing table. You could have my rings. I have my own, Mama. I don't need yours, especially since they're from that man. That brought out latent ire. Patty stood, squared her shoulders, and steadied her nerves. You keep calling him that man, 
but it doesn't make him any less your father. He may have been my father, but he was never my daddy. Uh, he left us, Mama. He chose to leave us with nothing. We had to try to survive without even the life insurance because he was a coward. Though shaking with repressed grief, anger, and hurt, Patty fought to defend her John. He was haunted by what he endured in Vietnam, Lisa. He could never get past it, but he tried. For you, he tried. So many men never were able to get past all that happened over there. We understand now what it did to those poor boys' minds. Why can't you have a little compassion? Because I was a little girl at his mercy, Mama. I was a little girl who had to be a mama to my daddy sometimes. No, I have no mercy for him anymore. Not after he left us like that. Not after what he did to you. Don't talk to me about him. The connection died at that. For the first time in 20 years, Patty sobbed for so many things. Her daughter's pain, her husband's torment. Her girlhood wiped away with the foolish pledge of, I do. Waking up and sitting bolt upright in bed at her age nearly wrenched out Patty's back. She panted, rubbed her lower back, and swung her legs over the side. Might as well shuffle off to the bathroom before rolling over. Instead of heading back to bed, however, Patty found herself creeping downstairs, making a nice hot cup of tea, and heating a slice of leftover pecan pie. The small watch box she'd cannibalized to make a temporary box for the unwanted rings sat on the table, waiting for her to take it to a pawnbroker. At the first bite of pie, Patty considered that, unlike most things she'd disposed of, those rings couldn't be replaced. Books... Movies, scarves, figurines, and even picture frames were all replaceable, but those rings. A new idea came to her by the second bite, and by the third, she'd retrieved some of the unwanted stationery from a to-donate box in the garage and had begun a letter to Lisa. Dear Lisa, it's late, but I can't sleep. We spoke about your father today and I probably didn't assure you of how much I do understand your feelings about him. What I don't think you understand, dear, is just how much your daddy loved you. I thought I'd write down a few memories so you'd have them. I'll put this with those rings that stirred up so much trouble for you and put it in the safe deposit box in town. Someday, you'll find this when I'm gone, and if you don't read it, I'll not even know. After ten years of marriage, hard years, I won't pretend otherwise, we both thought having children wasn't possible. I worked at the school as a secretary. Your father worked whatever jobs he found. Oh, you should have seen him jump and holler when I told him I thought I should see a doctor because I thought I was expecting. My whole pregnancy, he kept the same job and brought home a treat for me every night. In fact, he didn't change jobs again until you were almost two, and he got a chance to work at the car dealership, making more money. He held my hand, and he kept cooling cloths on my forehead all through labor. And when we brought you home, he'd wake up two and three times a night after your feeds to make sure you were all right. In fact, until the day he left, he'd get up at least once a night to make certain you and Lewis were covered and comfortable. Once... Just about the time I was due with Lewis, a little boy got mad at you at the park and pushed you down. Your daddy marched that little guy over to his father and demanded an apology. When Robbie McLaurin broke your heart in the third grade, he wept at the table, wondering why he couldn't protect you from pain and sorrow like that. At Christmas, he'd work extra hours and even nights delivering pizza so you both had wonderful days. Do you remember those? You were old enough to. The bicycle, the Barbie dream house, the rollerblades and those shoes that were ridiculously expensive. He loved you both so much, you especially if I'm honest. He left because he loved you, not because he didn't. The demons of his wartime experiences drove him, and eventually that meant away from us. Line after line, Patty wrote every story she could recall. The Christmas he'd tried to make snow and succeeded only in making an enormous mess. 
the magical birthday party where he'd been the clown, the magician, and the musical acts, one right after the other. The night Lisa had spiked such a high fever that when their car wouldn't start, he'd run all the way to the emergency room with her in his arms. By the time Patty finished, she'd used every piece of that pile of get rid of stationery and a few sheets of printer paper as well. It all went in marked envelopes for the safe deposit box. The sun peeked out over the horizon just as Patty crawled back into bed, spent. Lord, I did this for Lisa so she'd feel her father's love despite it all. But I feel like you did this for me. I feel like you did this so I'd remember how much John loved me in his way. I needed that too. Tune in tomorrow for the next chapter. Thanks for listening.